Let's talk a little bit more about the disc guard that we often find on Asian swords. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So I have shown this Chinese Dao um, previously in a video and I spoke a little bit about the disc guard and I just want to talk a little bit more about the disc guard. Now, the first thing to say is that this type of disc guard um, is obviously characteristic of the Chinese Dao, um, but you also find forms of disc guard, usually smaller than this in fact, on other swords from other regions. So most famously the Suba on a Japanese um, katana um, is a form of disc. It's not the same form of disc as we find on the Chinese Dao. Um, for a start we don't have this folded up lip that you find on the Dao. Um, and usually the um, Suba on a katana is somewhat smaller than this. This is fairly large. The uh, Suba on a, uh, on a katana or wakazashi forms or, tan, or tashi, um, any form of Japanese sword, actually gives relatively little hand protection, I would argue, it's fairly small. The um, Chinese form is larger, they vary in size, some are smaller, some are larger, but as you can see, it does, if I hold the sword straight on, my hand is more or less hidden behind it. Um, and someone noted to me, this is probably a Boxer Rebellion period Chinese Dao, someone noted to me that the average Chinese um, soldier, or boxer essentially, um, at the end of the 19th century probably would have been smaller than me. Usually this would have been the case. So yes, their hand would have been very slightly even than mine. So this sword, it's a fairly big sword, it's fairly heavy, weighs three pounds as mentioned in the previous video, would be even larger in comparison to a late 19th century Chinese, average Chinese male, true. Um, but the disc guard, why the disc guard? Um, well, that's very interesting. Um, the, the short answer I'm gonna give straight at the beginning and that is, we don't know. We don't really know why disc guards were popular in some places and other forms of guard were popular elsewhere. Let's just talk briefly about those other forms of guard. So what I'm not gonna do, because I think it's an unfair and silly comparison, is to compare with something like the basket hilt. The basket hilt grew up in a very particular um, period in Europe um, and for obviously for very particular contexts and, and cultural reasons. Okay, so we're not gonna compare to the basket hilt. It's very clearly a very different type of animal to that. Um, but what we could perhaps compare to is the medieval cross-hilted sword. So in a sense, you could say that the Chinese Dao and the medieval cruciform hilted sword, or arming sword in this case, one-handed sword, um, are from sort of similar contexts in that um, they both um, were used, generally speaking, with shields and they were both used against, sometimes against armour, sometimes against unarmoured opponents. Now, the Chinese Dao, um, which incidentally a, a similar design of sword was used by the Mongols and um, we also find similar swords in Korea, and the old Dao was almost certainly the basis for the development of the katana, um, if we go back to about um, 900, 1000 AD, that kind of date. Um, so the discard in that case, I would say it doesn't need to provide a huge amount of protection, as I mentioned in my previous video, because of shields. And I think you've got the same situation with medieval cross-hilted swords, which essentially grew out of the earlier migration period and Viking era swords, which had a shorter cross guard, um, and the Spartha, and I suppose if you go all the way back to the Gladius. So if we go back to the um, ancient era, the Roman era in, um, in Europe, obviously we have the Gladius, then the Spartha, then the migration era swords, the Frankish and Anglo-Saxon swords like the Sutton Hoo sword and all of these. Um, and then through to the Viking era sword. And there was a general tendency from the migration era through the Viking era, and then particularly around the uh, 10th century, we start to see the guards start to get longer more often. You sometimes find longer guards earlier on, but they became more consistently longer um, to about sort of this length in the 10th century. And then in the 11th century, we get basically what you see here. This is an 11th century style sword. So there was a very rapid increase in the length of the guard. Now, why was that? <laughs> that is another good question that we don't know the answer to. Fundamentally, we could argue that there hadn't been a need for a large handguard on swords 
um, previously because they were always used with shields. Okay, so um, there are two main types of shields that are used in the 11th century. One being the boss held shield and the other being the Norman kite shield. Um, if we just focus on the boss shield for a minute, it is noticeable that the um, in the 11th, uh, well, should we say 10th century, when the guards were still very short, this was the predominant type of shield used all over Europe. It was held, as you can see there, in the boss, hence the name boss, boss grip shield or boss held shield, um, and probably a lot of the time held extended in the arm. Now that might govern why you don't need very much guard on your sword, because everything you're doing with the sword, the hand is protected by the shield. What's interesting is when we get into the 11th century, suddenly you've got shields that are held with straps like this. Now this is probably partly because of the greater use of cavalry, and this means that you can hold the reins in the hand and they're probably a bit more com convenient for use on horseback. I have made a previous video where I argue that these shields are actually optimised for foot combat. I'm not going to get into that topic now because that's a big old topic by itself. But I would say that it does seem that longer cross guards start to come about at the same time as strapped shields come about. And I don't think that that's a coincidence because I can't extend my shield out as far now to cover my hand and so there's a little, and the shield probably becoming a little bit more, a bit closer to the body and a little bit more static than the boss grip shield. And so you need more hand protection. So my argument would be that the necessity for hand protection relative to the shield that's used is one of the reasons why the cross guard gets longer. Now you'll notice the cross guard points in the direction of the edges. That is because this is the direction that's most vulnerable, that you most often get hit. That's the direction which the sword is moving in. It's the direction that if someone, if someone else's sword comes in towards me and I defend it, if their blade comes down, it's going to come down there. Occasionally you get hit on either side, which is why in later centuries, in the 16th century, you get um, side rings and things like this, thumb rings even on, on Polish shavers. Um, but you do, you, know, you do get side protection on some later period tools, but predominantly the most dangerous direction is here um, in terms of protecting your hand. I should also mention that you get side protection on uh, 15th, 14th, 15th century um, Langmesser as well. Um, so the, definitely the cross guard or the hand, the hand guard, should we say, is relative to the shields used. Now, the shields used in... China, vary in size and shape, um, and vary in how they're gripped, but they are usually strapped shields. So I'm only holding the boss held shield as illustrative of, of the size of one style of shield that was used in, um, used in China, but they were usually uh, strapped. So you do need some hand protection with the sword, presumably when you're using it. Um, the swords weren't always used with shields, just as in Europe, occasionally they were used by themselves. So, for example, an archer might not be able to carry a shield as well. So an archer, if they pull their sword out, might only have the sword to fight with. Um, but the, clearly having the, the uh, disc guard there performs a lot of the same uh, duties as the cross guard does. It protects a little bit in front, a little bit behind, most importantly in front, I would argue. But you'll notice it actually, if anything, protects more at the sides than it does at the front. Now, why would that be? Um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I don't know. Um, it, could it be that they were binding with the blades less, generally speaking, in China? Um, and therefore, by proxy in Korea and Japan as well? I don't know. Um, it could be the case. Why would that be the case? I don't know. We do find 19th century um, commentators re writing about swordsmanship in that period. And they often say that Asian swordsmen don't parry as often as European swordsmen do. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. What do they mean by parry? Well, if I just grab a sabre, which is obviously the main sword that they're talking about in this period, if someone cuts at the side of my head here, a parry or a guard might just simply be moving the base of my blade to intercept the motion of the incoming blow. Okay, so this would be called cut or inside guard and this will be called preem or hanging guard. So I can either defend point up with the base of my blade or point down with the base of my blade. Both of them close this line and prevent me from being hit inside of the head. Um, 
But that's a block, uh, what some people call a static block, as if it's a bad thing, um, which of course it's not. It works very, very well, and you can find it in even in medieval uh, Mesa treatises as well. But um, what some systems also do, in addition to that, is rather than just sticking the sword in the way here, in which case a hand, hand guard is quite an important thing to have, there's another way of defending against the incoming blow. If the incoming blow is coming in here, what I can do is swat it aside with a blow. So in this case, for example, so if we get cut from right to left, we call that a, a, a one, a cut one, and this is a cut two, for example. So if someone cuts one at me, what I can now do is go cut one to knock their sword aside and cut two to hit them back. Okay, I'm changing, you can't see what, what my footwork I'm doing here, but I'm changing over feet. The general rule is if I hit from the right, my right foot comes forward. If I hit from the left, the left foot comes forward. That's taken from European uh, Dusak and Mesa. Um, so there are other ways to defend against an incoming blow. One of those is to simply cut into the cut and knock it aside. So in this case, their, if their blade's coming down like this, my edge is actually hitting into their flat. Um, so it could be that the Victorian writers are saying that Asian swordsmen don't block in the way that we did with um, broadswords and sabres in Europe by that point, by that date, but instead we're doing what we find more in earlier medieval and renaissance European treatises where they're actually cutting into cuts to knock, to knock aside the incoming thing. Um, who knows? If you're doing that, however, there is much less need for a handguard. And it could be that if you're doing this kind of thing where you're striking into someone's flat, then actually a guard it becomes more important at the sides of the blade than into the front and back. So that's one possible theory. Um, so, I think I'll wrap it up there. I'm not going to witter on for too long. Um, there's probably a lot more I can say about cylindrical or disc guards. One final thing, uh, actually, I just want to mention because it came up in my previous video, about this lip. So some people talked about these circular guards as being to prevent rain going down into the scabbard. Um, I'm not going to disagree. Certainly the guard by sort of incidentally performs that function. However, um, there are other much simpler ways of doing that and you don't need such a big disc to do that. And the guard's not as big as that disc, is it? That would, uh, sorry, the sc um, scabbard is not as big as that disc. Um, that very clearly is a hand guard. And same with Japanese swords, you don't need a suba of that size to prevent water or rain from getting down into the scabbard. You'd only need a disc of about that size, as big as the top of the scabbard, basically. Um, uh, the lip, I absolutely agree with some people who say that's probably to strengthen the disc. I think that's partly true. I also think my reason of making it more comfortable to wear may be a valid uh, reason. Never underestimate how much people adapted swords to make them more comfortable to wear because that's what you spend most of your time doing with the sword is wearing it, not using it. Um, but yeah, I think absolutely t having that lip does make the guard stronger, definitely. Um, uh, and maybe it was aesthetic as well, maybe they thought they looked better like that. Um, one final thing to say as well is that the disc guard is not unique to China, Japan, Korea and a couple of other Asian countries. You do find it in other places. Um, one that comes to mind off the top of my head is Ghana in West Africa, the Gold Coast. And um, there are certain swords there that sometimes have a ball-like guard, almost a bit like a gladius guard on them, um, and a pommel, incidentally. In fact, the whole hilt is a bit like a gladius hilt. Um, so that's a circular guard. That's worth noting. I don't know what you take away from that. Equally, the Nepalese Cora. Um, so the Nepalese Cora is a, a forwards. I'm trying to buy one actually, so I can make some videos about them because I'm quite interested in them. But I haven't managed to get one yet. They've got a forwards curved blade, a bit like a cookery, um, and the um, the hilt is usually sometimes they're tulwar hilted, but usually it has a disc pommel like a tulwar, but also a disc guard. So again, we've got a disc guard there. But really, most notably, the places where they have disc guards on swords like widespread is China and areas that were influenced heavily by China. So Mongolia, um, uh, Korea and Japan. Okay. Um, and you could say, you know, Dars in um, places like Thailand and Burma as well. 
Um, although they tend to be not really a guard, but almost nothing at all. It's more like just a ferrule, really, between the, um, between the grip and the, and the blade. Um, but one final thing I wanted to say was um, you don't only find um, cross guards in their most famously, of course, medieval European, but you do also find them in Africa. And although this looks very different to, so this is a, um, a Tuareg Tacuba, um, and although this looks sort of like a medieval sword, almost like an anime version of a medieval sword, it is a particularly broad one for anyone who's wondering. I'll make a video about this sword. But you'll notice it has a cross guard, and this one's actually made of leather, um, which I find fascinating. It does have iron inside it, but it's got leather around it. And, um, you know, so even in, um, most famously, the Sudanese Kaskara as well, which I have talked about in the past when I talked about Sudanese weapons. And um, these are from near to the Sudan as well. Um, so there are actually numerous uh, Arabic and African weapons that also have cross guards. So it does seem that globally, if we look at the world, the more normal solution, if we're a really simple handguard, is a cross guard. If we look at Africa, if we look at Europe, if we look at the Middle East, even if we go back into the ancient period, if we look at hot plight swords um, or you know Roman spathers, usually it's a form of cross guard, longer or shorter, but a form of cross guard. Um, and so really, it makes the disc guards of China and the Chinese influenced areas even more interesting, I think, because it really makes them stand out and makes them different from what I would argue is the more normal solution to protect the hand without a complicated basket hilt. You know, just with a simple piece of metal or other material, the simple way to do it seems to be with a cross guard. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.